Good evening, everyone. My name is Roger Sherman, and I currently serve as the Modern Classrooms Project Board Chair. And on behalf of the entire MCP Board, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight to learn more about the vital groundbreaking work of this organization. You were invited to this webinar for a variety of reasons. Some of you are educators. Some of you are friends of board members or MCP staff. Some of you are community members who care deeply about our collective future. Some of you are parents of school-aged children. And yes, some of you are philanthropists. Of course, some of you may be all of the above. To be clear, I'm not an educator, other than having a daughter who's a new teacher in the DC Public Charter School. I don't know much about what goes on in today's classrooms, but I've still been inspired by the mission of MCP and see the tremendous benefits for teachers, students, and ultimately all of us. No matter why you're here, we greatly appreciate your time and interest. I was first introduced to MCP in 2018 when I, along with several colleagues from the law firm Jenner and Block, became pro bono counsel to the organization. Our goal was to assist MCP with the legal issues associated with standing up a new nonprofit and connect them with telecommunications and technology partners that could assist by providing equipment and broadband access for MCP's future. We even brought the new chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission, Jessica Rosenworcel, to Eastern High School in the district to visit one of the very first modern classrooms so she could see for herself how technology was being utilized to fundamentally alter and improve the classroom experience for teachers and students. It turns out, however, we were thinking too small and in some ways missing the point. Utilizing broadband technology to improve the classroom experience is only part of the MCP story. Good connectivity and computers are table stakes for this endeavor. This effort is not about technology or mass produced content. Fundamentally, MCP is offering a compelling update to the stand and deliver classroom format many of us experienced while growing up. And if you think about it, what MCP is trying to do makes sense. Young people today learn differently than we did 20, 30, 40, and dare I say 50 years ago. Think about how your younger family members read, write, and process information. Students are coming to the classroom from all kinds of home environments. So why should we keep using the same classroom model for very different students trying to learn in the age of technology? When you throw into the mix a global pandemic that shut down in-person classes for over a year, it's even more clear that the traditional model of classroom instruction would benefit from an update that allows for more individualized learning and flexibility. In a moment, Kareem Farah and a couple of very special guests will talk you through what MCP has been doing and fine tuning over the past three years. And Kareem will share some amazing data that confirms the modern classroom model works. Before I turn it over to our CEO, just a quick comment about Kareem and his co-founder, Rob Barnett. Kareem and Rob are two of the most talented and motivated, in, motivated individuals I've come across in a very long time. I am confident their skills would translate to any kind of organization, including for-profit businesses. Yet they've chosen to dedicate their significant talents to this cause and the public interest. We're all better off because of it. Thanks again for your time tonight, and don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if I can provide additional information about MCP. Kareem, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roger. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight on a Thursday evening to learn a little bit more about our organization and what we've been doing. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about how we're empowering edu educators to actually build future ready classrooms at a time where frankly, it is most needed. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of today giving an overview about our story, how myself and Rob, my co-founder built the organization. I'm gonna talk you through how our model works. What is it that we're actually empowering educators with and how does it actually impact students and teachers? Then we're gonna be joined by some incredible educators who are gonna be able to share a little bit about their story. We're gonna do a little Q and A with me. And then finally, we're gonna close it out with Michael Brown of our senior advisors to share a little bit about what he thinks about our organization and how he has been supporting us on this journey. So I'm gonna start us off just a little bit about our founding journey. I was an educator for years. I, I founded this organization alongside my co-founder, Rob, in, in Washington, DC. We were both math, math teachers. We were teaching at a large public school, Eastern High School. Uh, we actually went to the same high school, interestingly enough, but did not know each other at the time, but we met at a math team meeting. Both of us disgruntled by the realities we were facing in our own classrooms. We were educators. We were taught to teach traditionally. 
the way that most educators are taught, but we knew something was fundamentally wrong with the way that we were supporting our students. We had students who were experiencing chronic absenteeism, trauma, well, multiple grade levels apart. We were using a traditional format, but we were not teaching not traditional students, which meant we had to think about how to really meet our students' needs in different ways. And the traditional approaches we were empowered with as educators in training wasn't actually working for us. So him and I collaborated. We built a different approach in our classrooms. And in 2018, I won the award for DC's most innovative educator. At that point, we realized there was real demand for our model. We started raising some funds. We did a pilot fellowship. We actually have one of our first or actually second year fellows who's going to join us on this call today to share a little bit about her experience with implementation and got it off the ground and running in 2018. And since then, we've empowered thousands of educators across the country and the world. Over 100 countries have actually been touched by our model. We continue to grow each and every day. And part of what I want to do today is share with you a little bit about what we've accomplished, but also where we're going. So let's go ahead and dive in. I kind of want to talk first just about the challenge nationwide, and there's different ways to splice this data, and you can look at local data and national data, but just understand the larger framework, which is that most educators walk into classrooms where students are not necessarily proficient. They're actually a broad variety of grade levels apart. You might walk into a math classroom or an English classroom where some students are reading at a fourth grade level, another group of students are reading at a seventh grade level, another group of students are reading at 10th grade level. Additionally, chronic absenteeism is a massive challenge for many, many teachers and students. 21% of high school students are actually considered chronically absent each year. And depending on the environment that you're teaching in, that number might be much, much higher. I always tell folks when the bell rang where I was teaching, on a good day, we had 50% of students actually there. So if I'm standing at the front of the room delivering a live lecture, teaching traditionally, I'm really only speaking to about half the students. And then finally, 68% of students experience at least one traumatic event before the age of 16. Students are experiencing trauma that's obviously accelerated by the nature of the moment. So naturally, students are coming into classrooms with really, really unique needs. And our organization is committed to the core idea that we actually have to build classrooms that are responsive to students' unique needs. We will not be able to support students and move the needle if we're not thinking about how we can actually respond to all the challenges they face and create learning environments that actually allow them to achieve their full potential. Now, this data just looks like numbers when you look at it on a slide like this, but I like to frame the challenge by trying to understand what it's like to teach in an environment where you have such diverse learning levels and social emotional needs. So when I was an educator, I would stand at the front of the room, lecture like I was taught to teach, and this was the first three years of my teaching experience. I taught traditionally, like most educators, learn how to teach. And first, when I was lecturing at the front of the room, my on grade level and present kids, this might be five out of 25 students on any given day, they're thinking the content's too easy. They're bored, their heads go straight down, they're frustrated. Why am I learning this way? Why are you teaching to the middle? You're not inspiring me. That was heartbreaking for me to walk into a classroom, prepare a lesson, deliver at the front of the room, and the kids that were most anxious to learn the content were immediately flustered and frustrated because I wasn't pushing them hard enough. Then there's another group of students, they're actually not there. And when they aren't there, what we do is we give them a packet, we send it home, we say, here, this is going to replace what you missed during class. But naturally, anyone knows that a packet of information isn't going to replace the learning experience you designed. So when they come back to class, they're frustrated, they're saying, I can't catch up, I don't know what to do next. They're overwhelmed, they're irritated, and that's going to actually contribute to them falling further behind. And then the majority of students are actually below proficient in the content, which means they're lost. You're talking too fast, you're lecturing at them, they're begging you to slow down, to create more time for them to actually work in a one-on-one -on -one and small group setting. And you can't do that because you're stuck at the front of the room. And you're thinking, well, why am I so bad at this? That's certainly how I felt. I'm doing everything I could do. I've planned my lessons just like I was taught to plan my lessons, but for some reason, I'm not actually able to meet my students' needs effectively. And from there, we realized that there was something deeply wrong with our approach to instruction. Something wasn't working, and we need to think about a different way to support our students' needs. And that's what inspired the creation of our model. So we went door to door and said, hey, are, are you educators struggling with the same problem? They said yes. But when we asked, do you have a solution? They all said no. And that's when we realized we had to think differently about teaching and learning. So that's what inspired the actual creation of our instructional model. Our instructional model is a three-part approach. It's a blended self-paced mastery-based instructional model designed to really think differently about you, about how you support students. Phase one of the model is saying, hey, we can get teachers to actually build their own instructional videos, replace that live le lecture that we put in front of the room that's really disengaging. From there, we can let students work at their own pace so that they actually work on the content that is appropriately challenging for their needs. And then finally, 
they're graded on mastery. So they go from one lesson to the next, not based on day of the week, but what they actually learned. I'm going to dig in a little bit now to what we actually do when we train teachers. What are the literal granular parts of each element of this model? Now, I do want to stress to folks that the much easier way to actually understand this model in action is to actually watch our Edutopia video. We have an awesome Edutopia video that was filmed in secondary classrooms. And the cool thing is, in a couple weeks from today, we're going to have our second Edutopia video that covers a second and fourth grade classroom, which is really, really exciting as well. So let's dig in. Let's first talk about blended instruction. What do we actually train teachers on so that they can implement this model? Well, phase one of this is to eliminate whole class lectures from normal classroom structure. That means when you walk into a modern classroom, whether it was my classroom when I was still in the classroom, the teachers you're going to hear from today, or any of the thousands of educators we've impacted, you're not going to see teachers talking at students. That doesn't mean we're replacing whole class collaboration, labs, paideia seminars, fishbowl discussions, debates. We are not replacing those. We're replacing those moments where students are sitting and listening and teachers are talking at students and they're just scribbling down their notes. What's really unique about our work is we actually train teachers to build their own instructional videos. We were one of the first, in fact, arguably the only organization out there that believes that educators can be their own digital content creators. Now we know, the studies have been showing this for years, that educators are the most important factor in student learning. So why would we replace educators with instructional videos that you can find online or built by someone else? Instead, our educators are authentic. They're the ones who actually understand students best. They need to be behind the screen. They need to be the creators of the content. And that's actually supported by the research. There's a variety of studies that actually show that when an instructional video is delivered to a student, when the, the creator of the video actually knows the kids, it's significantly more engaging. And this is frankly intuitive. I was an educator who tried to use externally made videos. My kids didn't like it. They were frustrated. They questioned my, my expertise. They wondered what my purpose was in the classroom. But when they could hear my voice and they knew I was the person behind the screen, it was exponentially more engaging. And it also allowed me to align what I was delivering to whatever priorities were in my school, my district, and my community. So that's phase one. Build instructional videos, six to nine minute videos, sometimes even shorter than that, that replace that live delivery of information at the front of the room. That's an inefficient use of your time as the educator. And it's a terrible use of our students' time as well because it's not particularly engaging. From there, we pivot to the second phase of the model. I always say the blended learning piece is the flashy part, but the really exciting stuff happens in self-paced learning. So in our classroom, students are self-paced within each unit of study. What that essentially means is I might launch a unit on a Monday and say, hey students, we're gonna tackle these 10 skills in three weeks, at the end of those three weeks, you're going to take a test. You're gonna submit an A project. You're gonna complete an essay. So you create these chunks, these bursts of self-pacing where kids know what they need to tackle in some sort of time frame, but then they get to be at different lessons at different times based on what they actually understand and based on what they're actually ready for. So it's self-pacing with guardrails. Now you may be asking, well, if you tell a group of students that they need to master 10 skills in three weeks, what happens if they don't actually master all 10 skills in those three weeks? Well, one of the beautiful parts about our model is we train educators to lesson classify. So I might identify which lessons in a unit are must-dos, non-negotiable. These are skills every student needs to master. Which ones are the should-dos? The ones we'd like them to master, but there might be extenuating circumstances that make that difficult. And finally, what are the aspire to-dos? What are the extension lessons that really are pushing kids in different directions who are ready to think beyond the current scope of the unit? You might imagine that a student might be experiencing a trauma during a three week span of time. They're missing 30% of class periods, not in their control. So they might only focus on those must do lessons while a student in that same class period can tackle all three lesson classifications. And then finally, we like to make our classrooms fun. So we create these cool student progress trackers. It's a really powerful way to sort of gamify the classroom and make sure that kids know exactly where they're at and where they should be. And so does the educator. These can come in the form of game boards, public trackers, whiteboards with magnetic names where kids can move their name across. One of my favorite elementary classrooms, each kid had a little football helmet with their face on. And every time they mastered a skill, they'd move on to the next skill and they'd actually move their football helmet on. It's a really cool way to empower students to be at the center of the learning experience. The final frontier of our model is mastery-based grading. It's the core idea that we all understand intuitively that to go on to the next skill, you actually have to master the previous skill. Anyone who's had kids and watched their kids learn how to do things, you know that a kid can't sprint before they learn how to walk. 
But for some reason, in education for years, we've just told kids that they should master skills. They don't actually understand it. We just push them through the system onto the next lesson, onto the next lesson, give them completion or, or partial credit grades and keep it moving. That's not how our classrooms work. Every teacher builds what we call mastery checks, bite-sized assessments at the end of each lesson that allow the student to demonstrate whether they've actually understood lesson two and allow the educator to actually measure whether that's the case. Once they've mastered that skill, great, you're ready to move on to lesson three. But if you haven't mastered that skill, it's time to revise your work, potentially get reassessed and reflect on your journey to actually get to mastery to see if there's something you could do differently. So really reinforcing the notion that to move on to the next skill, we don't do that just because it's Wednesday instead of Tuesday. We do that because you understood the previous skill. Now. I wanna talk a little bit about the impacts we intend to have on teachers and also the impacts we intend to have on students. So let's start with teachers. The first thing we want is to make sure we're supporting teachers and being well-planned. For teachers to do this model, they have to develop entire units in advance. If we're launching a unit on a Monday, we have to say all 10 lessons are already upload, uploaded to your digital learning space. All the videos, all the assignments, all the guided notes, all the mastery checks. It's no surprise the educators on this call and the educators we work with are some of the best planners out there. We want educators to be data-driven. I was an educator. I was a math teacher. In the first three years I was a teacher, I taught traditionally. I looked at a bunch of data. I used almost none of it. In our classrooms, teachers are using data to facilitate small group and individualized instruction for almost all of the class time. They're really using that class time to use data to drive the way they support their students. And finally, sustainability. You know, so many educators burn out of the system, and that number is getting higher and higher by the minute, especially during the challenges of the pandemic. And what we've consistently found is that educators burn out because they can't feel successful in their role as a teacher. I almost burnt out after year three because I was teaching traditionally, and I kept wondering, why am I not creating the impact that I intended to create? Is this actually the right profession for me? Because I'm standing at the front of the room. The majority of my students are not engaging in my content. I'm not seeing students master skills. So either I'm really bad at this or I'm doing something completely wrong. And you start to question whether or not the profession is right for you. So it really impacts teachers' desire to stay in the classroom. And I'll show some data towards the end of the today's presentation on how that works. Then finally, on the students. Let's talk about the impacts we want to create on students. First, 21st century skills. You know, the traditional format of teaching and learning is really structured in a way that you are hand-holding students through a learning process. You are delivering content at them. They sit and listen and take down some notes. You create this hyper-structured environment where they complete an assignment in a 30-minute span of time, and then we move on to the next lesson. But then they go on to the real world. That might be a college. That might be a two-year or four-year university. It might be a job setting where there's so much less structure. It's no surprise that a lot of parents on here who maybe have college-aged kids saw that their kids got blindsided with the level of freedom they were given after they graduated high school. We want to instill at a much younger age that students should become self-directed, self-aware young adults. In addition to that, differentiation. Differentiation is one of those terms in education that simply mean that we are providing personalized supports to students based on their need. It's probably the most important term in education, but if you walk into most classrooms across the country and the world, we're not actually differentiating to kids' needs. We're teaching the same thing almost through the exact same medium to the majority of students during class. And then finally, reinforcing the idea of authentic mastery. I've taught in a number of schools where we were graduating kids, 90% of students were graduating, but a very few percentage of students actually mastered content or, or were proficient in on grade level. So we sent the message to students that it didn't actually master whether it didn't matter whether you learned the content. All that mattered was that you actually graduated and got through the system. Again, getting blindsided in the real world when the expectations were quite different. Now, at the Modern Classrooms Project, I always say we're two co-founders who were used, used to be prop stats teachers. So we're big believers in measuring impact. So I'm going to talk through a few studies here that indicate why our model is having a profound impact on students and teachers. In 2019 and 2020, we did a control study. We took 55 teachers in the same school buildings and 1,900 students, and we said, what's actually going on with this model is do a control study. So half those teachers were modern classroom educators, the other half were not, and half of them, about half of them of the students were students in modern classrooms, and the other half were not. So let's start with the student impacts. Statistically significant gains here. Everything I show you statistically significant in a p-value of less than 1%. So on the student end, seeing kids teach themselves new things more, learn how to use technology more. 
getting more personal support and encouragement, such a critical idea here when we think about really creating an environment that's powerful for students, we gotta make sure that they're getting the support that they need. And they're more responsible for their own learning. So they're able to articulate that they're in a learning environment where they're in the center, they're getting the supports that they need. But the substantially more profound impacts happened on educators. When we took those 28 modern classroom educators and we compared them to the 27 traditional educators, we saw stunning gaps in these educators' capacities to support student need. 11% of traditional educators felt like they could help students catch up, 100% of ours. 44% felt like they could serve all learning levels versus 89% of ours. Only 14% of traditional educators felt like they could teach effective study skills, 100% of ours. And probably the most important data point to me as the CEO of the organization is, are we empowering teachers to spend more one-on-one -on -one and small group time with students, to get to know them, to build relationships with them, and to understand their needs and then personalize those needs? Only 19% of traditional educators are able to work closely with each of their students during class versus 86% of our educators. So that's really the most profound set of impacts that we uncovered. And the, the report itself pointed to overwhelming support for the model with strongest effects on teachers' ability to differentiate instruction. This is when we knew it was time to scale the organization, to get this model into as many educators' hands who wanted it. I'm going to talk a little bit here about what happened during COVID, by the way. We uncovered some really powerful impacts when we replicated this study during COVID. In the 2020-2021 school year, we found that MCP teachers, modern classroom teachers, felt significantly more capable of handling the moment. You see here, in comparison to traditional educators, our educators were much more capable of teaching students remotely. Probably the most important data points, the middle one here, only 56% of traditional teachers felt like they can go from in-person to remote. Our educators, 88% of them felt comfortable making that shift. And then finally, only 82% of, of teachers felt like they could support students in learning independently at home, whereas 99% of our educators felt that way. So not only are our educators finding a profound impact when they're in an in-person setting, but they're also significantly more capable of stomaching the blows of some of these structures and systems that you just don't have control over, kids quarantining, teachers having to go out, and we don't know when that's going to actually stop. Let's talk a little bit about this test scores. You know, we're an opt-in model, which means we never force teachers to learn our model. It's just not part of our mission. Our belief is we, we want to value teachers. We want to bring educators in who are, have an appetite to innovate. We train those folks, and we know that there's thousands, there's frankly millions of educators across the country who have an appetite to learn this type of work, and that's who we want to focus on. In this particular case study, it's a district we work with out in Concord, Michigan. 60% of these teachers enrolled in our program and learned our model. And what was stunning about this is they saw huge gains in their K-8 math scores in the fall and the winter. And what was most stunning about this is those scores increased during COVID, meaning pre-COVID, they had 32% proficiency in the fall, 24% in the winter, and that went up to 51%, 61% respectively, which was frankly stunning. That is not the national trends. The reality is we saw a lot of learning loss and a lot of challenges when kids were suffering through the pandemic, whether they were hybrid, remote, or in person. It was just a tough time. But this model allowed these teachers to support their students effectively, and they actually saw gains in test scores. I do want to speak a little bit to that long-term impact on teachers. One of the things that we think deeply about our organization is not only do we want to empower educators with an instructional model that's great for their students, but we also want to make sure that it's great for them as people. Educators are some of the most important people on the planet. We need to keep them in the classrooms. We need to make sure that they feel like they have a job that's sustainable. And we were incredibly excited to see the enormous shifts in teachers' perceptions of the profession as a result of our model. 85% of teachers enjoy teaching more. 78% of our teachers find it more sustainable. 72% are more likely to continue staying in the career. And my favorite data point on this slide, 85% feel more optimistic about the future of education. 94% plan to adopt these practices for the rest of the year. So we found that our model is durable. It's kind of addictive. When educators start to do it, they really don't want to do any other approach unless it's a way to enhance the model that they're using now. And this is something you'll probably hear from the educators on this call. Once you get committed to the modern classrooms approach, you see the benefits, you're not going back. Now, I do want to speak a little bit to how we train educators, and then I'm excited to bring our educators actually onto the call. So I want to talk a little bit about our teacher training model. The first kind of product that we have to offer as a nonprofit is the free course. We have over 30,000 teachers who've enrolled in this free course from over 140 countries. 
We are a nonprofit. We do not hide any of our resources and our materials. We never will. That's a core tenant of the way that we approach our work. So anyone anywhere can find our tutorials, our resources, our content, and our free course. We see about 20 to 40 teachers join this free course a day, new teachers enrolling in the course. And then we have our virtual mentorship program. Our virtual mentorship program is how we formally train teachers who want that structured support, who want feedback on what they submit, who want to be able to actually have a conversation with another teacher who's implementing the model, but do so in a scalable way. So we've created this virtual mentorship program. It's a really powerful way to empower educators with 90 school and district partnerships. Some of these partnerships are as large as being a, a sub-grantee on a large grant in Indiana where we're supporting 1,500 educators across the state. It's also small, like you can have one school that sends five teachers through our program. So we're really, really excited about being able to partner with schools, districts, states, and organizations across the country to empower as many educators as possible with our model. Now, what's cool is you see impacts on both these different professional development products. So you see here the increase in the, in the number of free users in our course. These are the number of educators in cumulatively who've enrolled in our course through September. And when we did a survey of 277 of these teachers, 99% had committed to one aspect of the model. 55% said they were implementing the model in full. So really powerful data on the fact the free course is making a really big impact on educators. But I want to talk now about how the virtual mentorship program works, because this is our baby. This is how we truly train teachers nationwide and globally. The way this works is if you were a teacher, let's imagine you were a sixth grade English teacher and you said, I want to learn this model, but I want to get the support that I need. You would enroll in our virtual mentorship program. Usually your district would pay for it. Maybe a local philanthropist would fund a scholarship for you to be a part of it. Maybe your states funded it. You didn't enroll. At that point, you get to work with an expert mentor. You get paired with a real educator who we've credentialed and said, this person's an all-star implementer of the model. So now you have a point person, who, a person who will support you through this journey of implementation, a person who will give you feedback, schedule calls with you, chat with you on Slack or by email to make sure you feel supported. You also hop onto some live presentations. They're all optional, they're all recorded. It's a way to connect with others and also get some of that structured delivery of information. And then finally, you have access to subject-specific office hours, private discussion boards, optional sessions as a way to continue to engage with a community of experts. How does this program work? Well, it takes about 25 to 30 hours for educators to complete this program. And during that journey, they're going to build real modern classroom lessons, lessons they can use in their own classroom. And that's done by submitting these five assignments. So any educator who travels through our program, they're going to create mastery checks, those bite-sized assessments at the end of each lesson. They're going to build actual instructional videos. They're going to make sure their nine minutes are under, ideally six with animations and annotations, and their mentor is going to give them feedback on that. They're going to submit a self-pacing plan and a learning design plan, and they're going to replicate that for three full lessons. So you leave this program, not just with the theory behind the model, but actual resources that you can use in your classroom to get the model off the ground and running. Now we train teachers during the school year and during the summer. In fact, the summer is the most popular time. We enrolled 1,300 teachers in our virtual mentorship program this past summer. And we have about 300, 400 educators enrolled in our virtual mentorship program right now because we launch a cohort every single month. Now let's just talk a little bit about the impact. So today we launched this virtual mentorship program in May of 2020. And when we did that, since then, we've enrolled 2,500 educators into our virtual mentorship program. And for most of these months, we've been at capacity because ultimately we can only train as many educators as we have mentors to support. And the feedback on this program has been outstanding. A 9.2 overall course rating, 95% of educators were recommended to their colleagues. And you can see huge shifts in teachers' experiences pre and post going through the mentorship program, their capacity to build videos, self-pace, learn how to use uh, assessments to actually measure student mastery and have a clear vision for how their classroom will work and how their students will learn. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about our teacher leadership opportunities. So one of the things we believe deeply in at the Modern Classrooms Project is we need to provide pathways for teachers to be experts, to be leaders and still stay in the classroom because those are the folks that are gonna spread our movement. They're gonna be able to empower other educators. They're gonna be the mentors that support other teachers in their community and nationwide and globally. So we have a credentialing process where if a teacher is doing our model beautifully, they submit a portfolio of work, we evaluate it against a rubric and we say, you're fabulous at this. You're a distinguished modern classroom educator. At that stage, you're eligible to become an expert mentor. You can apply to be a mentor, you go through our mentor academy, and if you actually get 
the mentor credential, now you can start working with teachers in the virtual space and training them. And the beautiful thing about this is we pay our mentors. We pay our mentors because we value teachers deeply and we wanna make sure that we elevate them and compensate them appropriately. It's a way for educators to stay in their profession but get supplemental income, scaling our model and supporting educators nationwide. Now, the beautiful thing is, we're gonna be able to hear from some of these folks today. So I have Monty Woodard, who is someone that I actually trained personally years ago in DC and was one of the first folks that actually started learning our model. And Jennifer Fisher, another incredible educator out in Tulsa, who's a high school business and marketing teacher. These are two of our teacher leaders, some of the best implementers of our model. And they're here joining us today to share a little bit of their experiences through this journey, working with the Modern Classrooms Project and educators across the country. Monty and Jennifer, welcome. I'm going to have you all introduce yourselves first. Monty, I'm going to go with you first. Monty, can you tell folks a little bit about your story? When you joined the profession, how long you've been in education? Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, my name is Monty and um, I'm a fifth year teacher. Um, I got involved with Modern Classroom during my, towards the end of my second year of teaching. Um, one of the things I struggle with right out the gate is that um, I had one class in particular and there was a kid in there who I was pretty convinced could teach my class, uh, but was very modest about it. Um, I had a bunch of kids who just kind of were like there, uh, not super engaged, but they weren't mm -hmm. disrespectful or anything. And I had, uh, I remember I had a handful of kids that year who, did not speak any English. And so I'm in this one room trying to teach them science and it wasn't going well. I wasn't into it, they weren't into it and it just felt bad for all of us. Um, and I started diving a little bit more into self-paced learning and I even tried to run my own little self-paced situation in class and it kind of flopped because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and that's when I kind of heard about Modern Classroom and, and they were opening up a new um, fellowship for teachers for the following school year. And of course, um, I was fortunate to get involved when I did because all I really had to do was have a conversation with Kareem. And he was like, yes, yeah, sounds great. Like you, you got it. Um, and, you know, I enrolled, did the, the, um, the one week I was a fellow. So we did a one week kind of like super intensive um, professional development and then we rolled it out and I haven't looked back since. Um, I feel like it's been great and I'm really glad that I was able to come across it. Thanks, Monty. And Monty was, you know, we had only trained eight teachers before I had went to Monty. We were a tiny organization. We didn't necessarily know how we were going to scale. We had a fellowship program, which at the time was just a small program that we were running in DC to really pilot our work. And Monty, Monty was one of the first implementers of our model. She's done a beautiful job ever since. Thanks for, thanks for introducing yourself, Monty. Jennifer is another one of our fabulous educators. Jennifer, do you want to share a little bit about who you are, your background in teaching? You bet. Um, so I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I have a very diverse background. Uh, I worked in the corporate world with State Farm Insurance, and then I worked for the Walt Disney Company, I've worked for the NBA, and I've worked for Apple. Um, this is my ninth year teaching. Uh, what I love is bringing the real world into the classroom. And what I noticed is as millennials were graduating and Gen Z was moving in, I really realized these kids learn differently. Um, <clears throat> and I felt like, excuse me, we needed to, our education system, the way we're teaching kids, it just wasn't having the impact. The, the old school lecture, take notes, take a test, all of that kind of stuff, it just wasn't working. And I was exhausted. Um, so I found Modern Classrooms when the world shut down uh, in March of 20 and did the free online course. And immediately I knew this was it. This was, this is exactly what's needed. Uh, then I went through the mentor program. Uh, Rob was my mentor last summer um, and started the school year in the craziness of COVID. And I can tell you, um, I probably would have gone back to the corporate world um, and not stayed in the classroom had it not been for modern classrooms. Um, so I became a bid advocate for it in my school. Got a lot of teachers now that are going through it too and their experience is the same. Um, it's, it's incredible to, to make that switch over to this model and just like Monty was saying, there is no looking back. I, I would not wanna teach any other way. 
Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. So I want to dig in a little bit more with both of you so you all can actually describe the shifts that you saw in your classrooms. I've had the privilege of actually watching Monty's classroom many times in my life, and I'm actually going out to Tulsa in a few weeks, and I'm going to be able to watch Jennifer in action as well. Monty, can you talk about the actual shifts that you saw in your classroom? What was it like pre-implementing our model, and what did you see change for your students? And then talk a little bit about what you saw change for yourself. What was different about being an educator in a modern classroom versus being an educator in your more traditional style of classroom? Yeah, so I'll start off with myself. I know that um, you reach a certain point in your teaching career where you start to kind of think about, you know, can I do this? Like, should I go somewhere else? Like, is it worth the work? And I feel like I was very much on a road, to, especially, you know, during COVID, like on a road to kind of be like, I think education, I need a break kind of thing. Um, and so I remember when I first started started implementing the excitement that I felt my first year of teaching or back when I, you know, I was an education major, so knew I was going to be a teacher. Some of that excitement that I felt in the beginning, it was like reinvigorated. Um, I, I love designing curriculum. Um, and eventually that's what I would love to go into. I love designing curriculum. And one of the things I liked about doing this is, you know, really looking at was the things that I doing in my classroom, were they effective? Um, how much time was it taking students? Was it just busy work? Modern classroom really forced me to look at everything that I was doing um, and, and make it important. And if it wasn't, um, what I liked about it is that the kids would tell me. Um, so what I noticed on the student end is that in a traditional class, you have a lot of kids who are not really active participants there. They show up because, you know, legally they're obligated to do so. Um, or, you know, someone will drag them there. They show up, but they don't necessarily participate. You know, sometimes they don't necessarily take notes or they'll write down what you're telling them to write down, but they're not really digesting the material. And what I like about switching over to the model is that it forces them really to take ownership because if they don't progress or move from lesson to lesson, it's really because they haven't bothered to, you know, do anything. And so I like that some of the ownership was shifted from me as the educator to more of the student. And I was able to have those conversations with families of like, your kid has this grade because they honestly, they're not really doing anything. And I think it was a different, and I had a lot of evidence to do it. And I think it was a very um, interesting conversation that I was able to have with um, families. Not only that too, um, I think I made students kind of like, you know, partners in what we were doing. You know, I, get, I took feedback all the time, what was working, what wasn't working. They were very resilient because I feel like every unit I was changing something. I was like, oh, my gosh, I thought of a new idea. Um, and, you know, the kids were just so great about it. They would give you feedback. But what I like about it is that I feel like sometimes as educators, we like to think we get very attached to the things that we do. Um, and we don't really necessarily consider them as individuals. We don't ask them what they want. I feel like in this model, because I can talk to them and I can survey them and we have time to do these things. I had a lot more informal conversations of like, do you like this? Like, what's up? Like, what, what, what should I do? What should I change? Um, and, and they're very honest about it. And um, I think it made me a much more reflective teacher. Um, and it honestly helped me with building relationships because I was able to have some of those informal conversations with kids that you might not always have in a traditional class. I love it, Monty. I mean, I, my capacity to build relationships, I always thought it was a strength of mine, but it accelerated so much more when I was able to do this model because of that one-on-one -on -one connectivity, the capacity to really talk to each student. And if a student was really struggling with something, be able to give them the space they need to kind of decompress, de-escalate, and then re-engage. So thanks for sharing that, Monty. Jennifer, what about you? I mean, talk, talk to me a little bit about your journey through the profession and the shift that you saw for yourself, but also for your students when you started implementing a modern classroom. You bet. Uh, and just, uh, you know, I'll give a ditto to what you guys said on being there for the kids. Um, we have a lot of at risk uh, students in my school and um, to be able to have that time that I can give them that personal support and encouragement, like the stats that Kareem was uh, sharing earlier is huge. Um, I can have that one on one time with kids. I'm not having to you know, re-lecture and do all of that kind of stuff. I'm, uh, you know, if a kid is out, I, they can watch that video and get that information right there. And I can work with another kiddo who's maybe struggling with something. I, I kind of liked uh, how one of my teachers put it uh, in our building. It's like you're teaching with kids, not at them. Um, and it's, so adaptive, this model, that's what I love, is it doesn't matter what level you teach, it doesn't matter what subject you teach, you can adapt it to your own style. And um, you can 
you can just play with it. Just like Monty's saying, you can say, hey, you know what? I really think I'm going to incorporate this into that. There's so many different things that you can do. And I think from the teacher side, especially now with COVID and everything that's been, it's been so hard. And there's so many teachers who are leaving the profession and there's so many who are burned out. This model, in, it really does invigorate you. It makes you want to keep teaching. It makes you, um, you just have more energy at, at the end of the day. You're able to meet kids' needs and be up and, and fully engaged. And it's just that energy in the classroom that really translates. I've seen higher test scores. I've seen better engagement from students. Um, they, they seem excited and want to learn, want to be in class. So it's so much more effective. I love it. I love it. You know, one of the things folks have been talking about a lot these days is this idea of building equitable classrooms, right? How do we create a space where kids truly have a real opportunity to achieve their full potential? I always tell folks, you can't talk about equity if we're not talking about access, if we're not talking about creating an on-ramp to success for students. If I'm a kid who's absent for a reason that's out of my control, and that means I missed out on the real learning experience. How is that an equitable learning environment, right? I'm a student experiencing trauma, and I can't digest a live lecture at the moment because I'm just too overwhelmed. How is that an equitable learning experience to put those students further behind because they can't access the content in the way that they need to or want to at the moment? Monty, I want to go to you again and just talk about kind of with the last question because I want to be sensitive to time. Tell me a little bit about how Modern Classrooms Project our organization has allowed you to be a teacher leader, potentially amplified your impact. Now, this is kind of a setup question because I know you so well and how much you've contributed to the organization, but I want you to share a little bit about the creative and different ways that you've engaged with our work and been able to be a teacher leader. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just very grateful because one of the things I'm always doing is I'm, I'm a very reflective person and I'm always trying to not only better myself, but better my situation so that I can make sure that my students are getting the most out of it. So, you know, you know, not only have I been able to make an exemplar unit that, you know, people going through the free course, they can see. And I get lots of emails and messages about my unit of like, wow, you were able to do this. Um, uh, this this unit. Um, so that was really cool. I have also was able to, you know, right when COVID happened, I was able to write um, an article for Next Gen Learning about kind of how even though, you know, the pandemic happened, I didn't feel so disjointed like a lot of my coworkers did. So I was able to do that. And not only that, um, I was one of the original mentors. So when we first rolled out the mentorship program, I remember getting an email being like, hey, we, we think this would be cool. Um, and so through the mentorship program, I've just been able to mentor a bunch of teachers. And so not every relationship is a lasting one. You know, sometimes I mentor teachers and, you know, they finish out the program and they kind of go on their way. But I've also fostered some really deep um, relationships with people just through the mentorship program who I still keep in contact with. One texts me every couple of weeks being like, hey, can you tell me a little bit about how you do this? One emails me periodically like, hey, can we talk? Can we meet? Um, and so I've been able to do that. And not only that, um, I co-run the Facebook group. So we have a very large uh, Facebook group following um, almost 8,000 individuals. And it's only been around, I think, going on two years in December. So we've had a lot of growth. And so I run that with a couple other modern classroom people. And so even through the Facebook group, um, it's unique because these are not necessarily people that have gone through the mentorship. This is normally free course individuals, people who have gone through the free course, who haven't necessarily done the virtual mentorship. Um, and who just, they share resources and it's just a really great um, community to be a part of. And through that, I've also fostered additional um, relationships. In fact, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'll pull people out and be like, hey, I think you'd be really great for the, the mentorship. And Rob and Kareem are normally pretty good. If I'm like, hey, I, I think we, we can make a way for this person. Um, I think I've done that for about three individuals and I still keep in contact with all of them. So I think just all of the opportunities that I've had just have continued to allow me to grow. Been on the podcast, uh, yeah, so done a lot of done a lot of things, a lot of things. You don't need to tell me, Monty. I know it. you've contributed a ton to this organization, <laughs> and I know you're going to continue to contribute a ton. So thank you for all that you do, Jennifer. Tell us a little bit more about what you've done um, at the organization, kind of outside the scope of just your classroom and implementing the model. And just to give some folks context, we run regional expansions, and one of the first places we went to was Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, so Jennifer, if you could share a little bit about how you've helped support us in kind of scaling out in Tulsa, that'd be wonderful. The, it is so exciting and truly uh, I am, I feel very blessed uh, to be able to walk on this journey with MCP. Um, I have to say, you know, having worked for 
Apple and having worked for the Walt Disney Company, that's a pretty high bar when it comes to a corporate culture and um, you know, the relationship that you build with your coworkers. And I have to say, I have that exact same feeling working with the people at MCP. Um, it is such an inclusive and supportive environment. When I was asked to be an ambassador and work with some of the other teachers here in the Tulsa area, uh, who is very exciting, but I was a little overwhelmed and like, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure I'm going to really like, you know, working with teachers because we all tend to be in our classrooms you know, you go to PD and they throw a bunch of here, you should be doing all of these things in your classroom. And you're like, OK, and then how do I do this? And you're kind of lost. Um, and this whole support system is is for real. There's all kinds of things like Monty doing the, all this stuff on the Facebook. You can reach out to your mentors. You you have this huge network of people. So as we started growing in Tulsa, now I love working with other teachers. It is such a fantastic um, team concept. There's a lot of camaraderie between us that we can say, hey, that was a really cool progress tracker. Can I, can I see that? And sharing information and helping each other and coming alongside each other. To me, that was the, that was kind of the unexpected blessing that came with being involved with MCP. So it's really fun to be able to now share some of those resources with other teachers who are starting out and, um, and meeting. It seems like every time we have a Zoom or different things like this, I'm meeting some incredible educators that um, you learn. It's just a constant uh, give and take. I love it. It's wonderful. Thanks, Jennifer. And Jennifer sometimes undersells her impact. She has recruited about 50 educators in just Tulsa alone to join the program. She coaches them. We chat with her monthly. It's been pretty inspiring to see. Well, Monty and Jennifer, I mean, not only are you all probably the busiest people out there on the planet at the moment as educators, but you're all making an incredible impact on students and on this organization. So I want to thank you both for jumping on today, sharing a little bit about your experience. I get to talk to you all all the time. It's always great to bring you on again. So thanks for your time, both of you. Thank you, guys. So I wanted to share a little bit more. You know, you just heard from a distinguished modern classroom educator and a mentor. And I want to just share a little bit about the soap, scope and scale of this work at the moment. So for educators to be distinguished modern classroom educators, they have to submit that portfolio of work and we assess it using our research-backed rubric. We have over 100, I mean, we have 178 exactly DMCEs, but a few applications came in in just the last few days. This is a cohort of all-star implementers that we plan to grow. They rep they're represented in seven different countries and 50 states, and those DMCEs alone are impacting about 15,000 students. And then we have our mentors. And as Monty said, Monty was one of our first mentors. We have over 100 mentors in action. These are the folks that are training other educators in the virtual space. They've mentored over 2,500 educators. And what we love about our organization is a lot of the money that we're raising, a lot of the money that we're generating to actually do the work part of that actually goes directly to great educators, great teacher leaders who deserve to get compensated for what they do. We've compensated since May of, 20, May of 2020, over $300,000 have gone directly to mentors for all their hard work training other educators. So I wanna talk a little bit about our three-year impact goals, just so everyone knows where we're going. So to date, you know, we enrolled those 30,000 educators into our free course, but we've trained 2,500 plus educators through our formal training programs, through those 90 school and district partnerships. We've estimated it's about 175,000 students we've impacted, but we have some big goals. We plan by 2024 to train 25,000 teachers a year and impact 2 million students a year. Those are our goals. We want to achieve those goals, and we have a clear vision for how we can get there in a way that we can get there sustainably. And to get there, there's a few things we have to accomplish to get there. And I want to talk about why we think we can get there and why this is the right time. And currently at the moment, our model is actually uniquely structured to meet the unique needs of educators and students right now. And here's why. What we know, first of all, is that teachers like Jennifer, like Monty, and teachers across the country, they're serving a greater diversity of academic and social emotional needs than ever before. I mean, you can read article and article debating how much learning loss there is. Instead of spending time debating that, we can just come to the common conclusion that kids have greater need academically and emotionally. In addition to that, 
students will continue to miss in-person class. If you talk to a teacher right now, if you talk to a leader right now, you're going to find out that the challenges of the moment mean that students are sometimes having to quarantine. They're not going to be able to be in class. Same thing with teachers. And we find that traditional models of teaching aren't built to handle that reality. We don't know if it's going to stop. We don't know the trajectory of the pandemic. What we know, though, is this reality might continue for some time, and we need to make sure teachers have the instructional models that allow them to handle the moment. And then finally, after the last 18 months of hybrid and remote instruction, educators are actually really good at tech. Now is the time to empower more educators with models like these. Now is the time to equip them with the actual structures and systems they need to leverage what they learn to apply it to a really powerful in-person model. So what do we do? Well, we actually empower educators with that model. We give them that blueprint and allow them to actually utilize those new skill sets to build equitable classrooms and ones that are responsive to, to really the unique needs of students and ultimately create future ready classrooms that aren't reliant on synchronous instruction, that aren't fixated on this teacher-centered model where teacher puts on a performance and kids listen, but instead actually maximize one-on-one -on -one and small group instruction. And the way we're actually gonna achieve these goals is we first need to grow our distinguished modern classroom educator and mentor community. We need to ensure that we're elevating and amplifying our best educators. We can only grow as big as our teacher leaders exist. So we need to grow that group of folks. We need more Montes, more Jennifers, more incredible educators to lead this movement. In addition to that, we're gonna launch and scale modern classroom regions. We're gonna open up regional hubs across the country. We're targeting right now, DC, New York City, Tulsa, the Twin Cities, Washington State, Connecticut, all areas that we plan to go to launch regions and many more if we can find the community of funders to support that journey. And then ultimately, this organization is going to scale when we actually expand our school and district partnerships, when we partner with schools and districts that have access to the largest number of educators to work with their admin to get this model into the hands of as many educators as possible. We have 90 school and district partnerships. Now we plan to have hundreds as we transition into achieving those three-year goals by 2024. Now, I want to introduce a really special guest. Michael Brown is a person I've had the absolute privilege of working with since I met him a few years ago. He is the co-founder of City Year. He led the organization. It's been an honor to work by his side as he's advised us as a senior advisor and supported us on this journey to grow the Modern Classrooms Project. I'm going to kick it to him so he can share a little bit about his journey working with us and watching us scale this organization and helping us build the strategic plan that we are currently working on today and trying to execute every single day. So, Michael, welcome. Thank you, Kareem. It has been a joy to work with you and Rob and the team, and it's terrific to be with all of you tonight. So two years ago, when I was still leading City Year, I got an email from Rob Barnett, a City Year alum. He said he started an organization with his friend Kareem Farah, a Teach for America alum. I was immediately intrigued. Rob asked to meet, and from that very first meeting, I was immediately inspired by their vision and the clarity and power of their model. A year later, I started Public Purpose Strategies to help high potential social entrepreneurs reach transformation points in their work. And as I hope you all agree from hearing tonight's presentation, the potential for the Modern Classrooms Project is not just high, it's sky high. For me, the most powerful aspect of the Modern Classrooms model, as Kareem shared earlier, is its commitment to establishing equitable classrooms. For those of us that can remember as far back into our own lives, the truth is that it's never easy to grow up and succeed in school every day. But in communities of concentrated intergenerational poverty, and too often in communities of color, there are many factors that work against student success. And that makes it harder for students to come to school prepared and to learn every day and to stay on track with their coursework. Now, well, of course, it's not a panacea for educational inequity or social and racial injustice, but the modern classrooms model is a powerful educational response. For students, as we've heard, the coursework becomes self-paced so there's no discouragement or judgment for a student who is behind and no holding back for a student who's ready to move ahead. For teachers, as we heard so powerfully from Jennifer and Monty, modern classrooms is a pathway to what so many teachers have feared they would never be able to do, to reach and teach all of the students in their class. The modern classrooms model changes that dynamic. As one teacher said after implementing the model, and I just loved hearing this line. I feel like I just cloned myself. Another aspect that I find so powerful 
about the modern classrooms model is its relationship to technology. As we all know, there's so much promise in technology, including its use in modern education. Modern classrooms leverages that promise, but it never loses the number one thing that is critical to learning, an authentic student-teacher relationship. When so many education models are just high tech, modern classrooms is both high tech and it's high touch. And as we heard tonight, it's the student's own teacher on the screen, the same teacher who answers their questions and checks in with them every day, the same teacher who knows their unique interests and what's going on in their lives. And frankly, those videos are fun and creative. So with modern classroom techniques, as we heard tonight, teachers feel more effective in their work. As we all know, effectiveness is a powerful feeling. We all want and need to feel effective in our work. For teachers, feeling effective can keep them in their profession, a profession they love, and even remind them of why they became teachers in the first place. From an organizational perspective, the Modern Classroom Project has an ambitious plan. You just heard it from Kareem. Their impact grows by having teachers who use the model teach other teachers to use the model. What a simple and powerful way to scale up. The beauty of the modern classrooms approach is that the modern is that the model works for an individual teacher who wants to adopt it or an entire school or an entire district. Modern classroom projects plan, as you just heard, is to reach 2 million students by training 25,000 teachers in three years. Needless to say, it's a very ambitious plan, but it's completely doable. And it promises to have a transformational impact on the success of thousands of students and teachers. For those of you on the webinar tonight who are in philanthropy, I encourage you to look deeper into the Modern Classrooms Project and to invest in this remarkable model and organization. If you're an educator, a principal, or a district administrator, or just an interested parent, I encourage you to get to know this powerful model and see if it is right for your classroom, your school, and your community. I founded my own organization more than 30 years ago. And in that time, I can tell you that I've met and worked with many outstanding young leaders who have also founded organizations. All of them, like me, were motivated by their passion for change and their dream, as one of my heroes, Robert Kennedy, liked to say, to seek a newer world. In all of those years, I can tell you that I put Kareem Farah and Rob Barnett at the very top of the list of leaders who are demonstrating that they have the ideas, the leadership, and the management skills to bring about tremendous positive change in classrooms across America. In fact, some of you may be old enough, like me, to remember that in 1975, Bruce Springsteen was on the cover of both Time and Newsweek in the same week. And a music critic famously said, I have seen the future of rock and roll and its name is Bruce Springsteen. Now, as we've heard tonight, and as many of you on tonight's webinar may already experience directly, when it comes to educational equity, effective learning and teaching, teacher retention and career satisfaction, and a highly transferable and scalable model, I think I can say with the same level of inspiration, excitement and confidence, I have seen the future of classroom teaching in America, and its name is the Modern Classrooms Project. So Kareem, congratulations on all that you, Rob, Roger, and the board and the team have already achieved and everything that you're building. And now it's back to you to close us out. Michael, thank you so much for the incredibly kind words. I've had the privilege of being able to meet with Michael every single week. As he certainly knows, I call him whenever I got a problem. I call him whenever I want to update him on something exciting. He's been such an incredible support system for us. If you know about Michael's background, what he's done for the world and for the world of service and for education and for students across the world is absolutely extraordinary. So thank you for your kind words, Michael. Thank you. Right back at you. I want to close us out just briefly with some ways that you can think about staying engaged with our work and help us grow this movement. And we really do call it a movement because we are building a movement of educators who are going to actually change the landscape of classroom instruction. So how can you stay involved? Well, first, and something just went nuts on my screen. Give me one second. I'm going to stop share and share again. So how do you stay involved? 
Well, the first thing you can do is help us grow the movement by building awareness. As Michael said, you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're a school leader, you're a district leader. Just share our model, learn about our resources and be able to share it across the world. That's the most powerful way we get out there. We want to be a viral movement, a movement where educators can access this anywhere. Another way is to connect us with schools and districts and philanthropists who wanna learn more about our work. If you know someone who thinks, wow, they really like to make an impact on education, they'd like to learn more, feel free to connect us. I'm always available to have those conversations. Finally, support our work directly. If you're a philanthropist, if you like to fund organizations, if you make, like to make an impact, make a donation to our work and that'll empower us to empower more educators to build future ready classrooms. You can contact me at any time. My email is kareem.fair at modernclassrooms.org. Feel free to reach out with questions to set up a call to learn more about our organization. You can also go to www.modernclassrooms.org to actually visit our website. Watch our Edutopia video. Be on the lookout in two weeks. There's going to be another one at those elementary classrooms. So thank you all. It's 8 p.m. now. I always want to make sure that I'm on time. Thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate you all. Thank you to all the guests. Thank you, Roger, for opening up. Thank you to the board for inviting folks. Thank you, Jennifer and Monty, for the incredible work that you do every single day. And thank you, Michael Brown, for the kind words and your support throughout this journey. I hope everyone has a wonderful night and enjoyed today's webinar.